Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. Uh, I want to thank everyone that's been praying for me. Um, I'll be doing another video for like an update video, but I wanted to get really get into this study that I've been doing. So make sure to to finish this study about 1 Timothy 3.16. And what part are we in? We're in God was seen of angels. Right? So make sure you have your King James Bibles out. It's going to be a lot longer study than I wanted it to be because I wanted to kind of go into a little bit of what the Old Testament says angels are and try to compare angels to men and then talk a little bit about the angel of the Lord and then we're going to get into where Jesus was actually seen of angels once we understand what angels are and the comparison. So... Make sure you have your King James Bibles out. This is my big one, so I don't want to have to hold on to this one. And I've got my small one here with some spots where we're actually going to physically, I'm going to physically read. But because of how long the study is, I'm going to be reading from here. So, um, so 1 Timothy 3.16. Go ahead and turn there. That's the main verse that started this whole series of studies. Um, 1 Timothy 3.16. And without controversy. In other words, there's no... There shouldn't be any debate, shouldn't be any arguing, okay? Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. We're allowed to talk about it, brothers and sisters of Christ. We're allowed to study it, and we're allowed to talk about it, you know? And God showed me this, let me show you this, or God showed me that from another brother or sister in Christ. But without controversy, uh, we're not going to understand God fully and completely, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. We talked about that in part one. Justified in the spirit. We talked about that in part two of this series. Seen of angels. We're going to be talking about that one today. Preached unto the Gentiles. We'll get to this one. Believed on in the world. Received up, or sorry, received up into glory. Okay. So what we're going to be talking about is he was seen of angels. Okay. God was seen of angels. Turn to John 1.50. I've read this verse and it's really kind of just a great, a better opener for this study. John 1, chapter 1, verse 50. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Capital S, Son of Man. Talking about Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, in the Millennial Kingdom, as a good example, okay, we become as the angels. We're going to be ascending and descending. Jesus is going to be physically ruling and reigning in Jerusalem on His throne. And we are going to be carrying out His orders. Okay. We're going to be enforcing His laws. Okay. But we're going to be ascending and descending. Okay. That's a great example. But we're going to be talking about angels. Angels have been descending and ascending um, since uh, you go back to, I don't have this in my notes, but you go back to, my brain freezes sometimes, the flood. Noah, before Noah and the flood, you had angels that left their first estate and came down and, got, and married women of men, the daughters of men, and married them. Okay, they left their first estate, but they came down. Okay, you have ascending, or descending, and then there's times where you have angels that are ascending. Okay? But first, what are angels? Today, the world talks about angels. I was, growing up, I always thought, you know, you have babies with wings that are angels. You have female, or not female, Women, I want to use the Bible term, not the worldly term, forgive me. Women, angels. You've got men, angels. You've got them with wings that are half animals, half men, and all kinds of stuff. And it's just, it just gotten so confusing on what angels are as a lost person in the world. And when I truly got saved, and um, King James Video Ministries had a great uh, audio study way back in the past, audio study, and it's still good today, about angels, what are they? And we're going to go through some of it, but not everything that he went through. So if you really want a detailed study of angels, what are they? Um, you can look up that study. If I can find it, I'll link it below and everything. But what are angels? 
Okay, I want to go back to one instance of Abraham's encounter with three men. Or three angels. Or God manifest in the flesh. Let's get into the story. Okay. So Abraham encountered with three men. Turn to Genesis chapter 18, verse 1. Genesis 18, 1. We're going to be kind of pushing it fast because like I said there's a lot of stuff I want to go over. I have six pages of notes, uh, mainly because I print out the verses. But usually when it gets to six pages, we're looking at a long to over an hour study. So Genesis 18.1, let's look at an example of these men that are mentioned, but they're angels, but they're seen as men. No wings, I'll just throw that out there real quick. No wings, no women, no children, men, young men, 30, I'll say it's like 30 year old men. Okay. Genesis 18.1, and the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he's sitting out there in the heat of the day. He's sitting in the door. That's where the breeze, trying to catch any breeze that comes through. And I, I can feel that because I try to set out my deck when it's hot. And sometimes you get that breeze. And when it's hot and you get that breeze, it just feels good. You try to find the places around your property that you can go sit in the shade where there's shade. And that's just off on a tangent. But I, I understand what he's talking about in the heat of the day. We get those days where it gets really hot. It's like too hot to even be outside. And I don't, have, I don't use AC here. I use fans. So uh, I understand. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. When Abraham looked at him, he didn't look and go, wow, these are angels. Look at the wings. I also left this part out. Halos. They try to say there's like a halo above their heads. So they got wings and they've got halo. These are like angelic beings. That's not what Abraham said. He looked and said what? Three men stood by him. They're men. But there's something different about them. He, he can sense that there's something different. They're not, they're not like other men. But they still look like men. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself towards the ground. Like I said, he, he said there's something a little different about these men. And said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight... He said, my Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Lord. So the Bible tells us that one of those three men is God in the flesh. It's Jesus Christ. If now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts after that ye shall pass on. For therefore are ye come to your servant, and they said, So do as thou hast said. The main point of this is when he looks, he sees three men. Two, we're going to find out later, we're going to, keep, we're going to jump around a little bit, but we're going to find out two of them are angels, like just regular angels, and the other one is the angel of the Lord. It's Jesus in the flesh. Verse 20, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, Jump down to 20, I'm sorry. Jump down to 20. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me. And if not, I will know. Okay. This is the Lord. the third One of the three men that he saw there. Okay. Lost my place. Give me a second. Whether they, uh, first 21. I will go down... Now, and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. The men turned their faces and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. So out of the three men, remember they just look like men. That's why we're going to get further down when we get into study. We're going to talk about the angel of the Lord, which is Jesus Christ. Okay, he's referred to as an angel but of the Lord. So you got three men here that are angels. Two are regular angels. One is the angel of the Lord. But how are they perceived by Abraham? They're special. They're different. He realizes one of them is the angel of the Lord, bows himself, calls him the Lord. But when he looks and sees him, he sees men. No wings, 
No halo, not women, not children with wings, you know, baby angels, none of that junk, none of that garbage. Okay? They're regular men. But they're a little bit different. Okay? Getting ahead of myself, we'll be talking about how we're made a little bit lower than the angels. But there's something that they're just a little bit above us that we look at them and there's just something about them that they're different. But it's not about appearance, it's about how they present themselves. You know, you have people who sit there and they know, you can have people when they're doing a job that's dangerous, you, you can tell the difference between someone who's done it for years and is experienced from someone who's this his first time. You know, you kind of look at that person and you can tell, well, that's, that person doesn't have that, you know, that courage, that strength, that, you know, uh, stability, that they know what they're doing. But then you look at the guy that's been doing it for years and he's down there, he's, you know, he knows what he's doing, he's got that courage, he's got that knowledge, he's got that strength, the stability, and you're like, you can tell the difference. With these angels, you could tell a difference between angels that look like men from regular men. We'll, we'll read a couple other stories too. Uh, jump down to 33 where it said, And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. The Lord went his way. So the Lord sent two angels to Sodom and Gomorrah that looked like men, and he himself stood there and talked with Abraham. Abraham wasn't ta looking up in heaven to the clouds and talking to the clouds. There was a man there that he was talking to that was Jesus Christ. Okay? God, manif not manifest in the flesh, but God in the flesh. It's manifest in the flesh when he comes in the likeness of sinful flesh, which we'll get to. But in the Old Testament, he was an incorruptible body. There was a physical body that was Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. He just wasn't known as Jesus. Why? Great is the mystery of godliness. It wasn't revealed to us that it was Jesus Christ until after the New Testament. The death of Jesus Christ. Okay. It's revealed to us today. Uh, Genesis, turn to the next chapter, Genesis 19.1. Because I want to talk again about those two angels that went into the city. How does Lot perceive them? Does he perceive them as these angels with wings and halos and, and all these, sometimes they transform in different creatures, saying they're angels or babies or trying to make it where there's men and women angels and everything? There's just men. You go through the whole Bible, the Old Testament, anytime there's an angel or the angel of the Lord, it's a man. They're only men. Angels are only men. Okay. In the Old Testament. But Genesis chapter 19, verse 1. And there came two angels to Sodom. Two angels. They were referred to as men when they were with Abraham, but now they're letting you know here who those two men were. That's how we know they were angels, because it doesn't talk about it there, but it talks about it here. Those two men were angels. But I, Abraham looked at them, they're just men. But there was something different about them. And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat at the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them and bowed himself with his face towards the ground. And he said, Behold now my lords, lowercase l, lords. He sees them as men. But he understands how wicked Sodom is, especially at night. How wicked Sodom is. Turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in with him, and entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round both old and young, all the people from every quarter, and they came unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the angelic beings that came in with wings and halos and they're just magnificent? Where are those pe beings, those angelic beings? That's not what they said. What did they say? They said, Where are the men? They look like men. Where are the men which came into thee this night? They're men. And where are angels? They're men. But they're above us. All right. We were made a little lower than the angels. Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him. 
and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as good as in your eyes, only unto these men do nothing. For before they came, they under the shadow of my roof, and they said, Stand back. I'm sorry. I skipped something. Let's start at 7 again. And said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. 8. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them unto you, and do ye to them as good as in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. For, for, therefore, they, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. Now this is a whole other thing. Some people say, well, that's because Lot started getting perverted. He shouldn't have said that. I, I agree. Um, but the whole point is, is sodomy is far worse than fornication in, in God's eyes. Okay? But that's a whole other study. It's still wrong. Don't get me wrong. But the thing is, is sodomy is worse. And that was the main reason I believe God destroyed that city. Sexual perversion period of all kinds. Okay, and I don't have to go into all of it, but it was bad. And yes, if you, if you spend a lot of time in that situation, in that environment, that's why we always tell you, just side note, for this event, we always tell you that when it comes to an environment, make sure you have a godly, God-fearing environment. Your home, the home I'm in right now, is a Bible-believing, God-fearing home. Abstain from all appearance of evil, free, home. You need to be in an environment that's godly. If you put yourself in an evil, wicked environment, like Sodom, and you just your home looks like the world at, and, and everything, and you're, it's going to pull you away from God, and it's going to pull you towards the world. And that was happening with Lot. Lot was still considered a righteous man in God's eyes because he loved the Lord. He probably still did, you know, what he was supposed to do to cover his sins. He's not sinless. Okay, there's a difference. But the point is, is he was starting to get pulled away. Make sure your home is a godly home. Verse 9, And what was the crowd's reaction? And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came into sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. In other words, Lot's not one of us. He came in here to sojourn. Came in here to find a job. Got a job and everything. Sojourn. He's not one of us. And that's one thing you say, praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm not one of them either. Especially today when it comes to the lost world, these false Christians, fake Christians out there. You're not one of us. Praise the Lord. These Babel building going people. I'm not one of you. Praise the Lord. Lot, you're not one of us. Well, praise the Lord. Needs to be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them? And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came here to break the door. But the men put forth the men, who's it talking about? The two angels. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. And this is the main point of me reading all this. Part is when it talks about them being men. Right? Shut the door, verse 11, and they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they were weary to find themselves to the door. You know, when you read in the uh, day about the angels in Revelation, angels can do things we can't do. That's what makes them a little bit higher than us. I'm sorry, I'll say it again. Angels can do things that we can't do of ourselves, by ourselves, as men. Okay? What did they do here? They reached forth their hands and they blinded them. Did they have to say, Oh Lord, please blind these men. No, they just blinded them. Now, if you, I wanted to read it, but for the sake of time, uh, set, if you want to pause, turn to 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8 through 18. Okay. you got Elisha. I want to make sure I get the right. Uh, and a king of Syria sends an army for Elisha. And what Elisha does is he prays to the Lord, and Elisha has the Holy Spirit in him, and says, Lord, smite these men with blindness. And then if you read the story, he leads them all the way back to out of the, like they're just completely far away from their land. But I think back in their own land. And then he God said, Lord, give them their sight back. So a man could do what the angels, couldn't do what the angels did of himself. But through the Holy Spirit and with the Lord saying, Lord, 
blind these people. Okay? But there was a difference. Okay? The angels represent God. Remember what Jesus said to Abraham? I will go see what's going on in Sodom. Did he physically go down there? No. He sent two angels. They were representatives of Jesus Christ. Okay? He says that we will be as the angels in heaven. Okay? We're going to have the mind of Christ someday. This corruption shall put on incorruption. This mortal shall put on immortality. And there's going to be a day where we're going to be the same way. We're going to be a, like a, a branch of God as far as doing His will. We're going to know His will. We're going to be doing the work of the Lord and serving Him for all eternity. But it's different with man. Right now, we have to go through the Holy Spirit. Right now, you got to get saved. I'm sorry, today you have to get saved. But in the Old Testament, you had to go through a man of God that had the Holy Spirit. Uh, before, and I'm talking about with Abraham, it was before the law. So with Abraham, you had to have men that were righteous in God's eyes. Their faith was accounted to them for righteousness. And, but God didn't just talk to anybody and show himself and appear to just anybody. But you can read that story. There's a difference. Do, can angels do things that are supernatural, spiritually supernatural? Absolutely. They blinded all those people. Both great and small were blinded. And that should tell you something. Both great and small is talking about old elderly down to the very young children. That's how, that's how messed up Sodom was. Okay. But there we have an example of, and there's some others that you can look up, um, of angels. They're men. They can do some things that the average man can't do. Okay, when it comes to creation. They were created, we were created. Mankind was created, the angels were created. We were created a little lower than the angels. What about Jesus? He was standing there talking to Abraham as the angel of the Lord. Okay, it didn't say the angel of the Lord, but it just said capital L-O-R-D, Lord. But there are three men. That mentions once they get down to Sodom, uh, and Gomorrah, it talks about those two men being angels. Uh, turn to Judges 13.1. Judges 13.1. Here's a great example of Jesus as the angel of the Lord. He's referred to as an angel. And I keep saying this because we're going to get to a point that's so important about the ultimate counterfeit. I'm doing a study that's separate than this about really getting into what the ultimate counterfeit is. But we can talk a little bit about it in this study. But Jesus, is, in the Old Testament, is the angel of the Lord. Judges chapter 13, verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. Forty years. And there was a certain man at Zorah, of the family of them in the hand of the Philistines forty years. I'm sorry, I did it wrong. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines. And there was a certain man at Zorah, of the family of of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto the God from the womb, and he shall begin, begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. Verse 6. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, I saw an angelic being. A just, a just amazing angelic being. I keep throwing that out there just to make a point. Don't fall for all this garbage that's out there, brothers and sisters in Christ. What does she say? She came back to her husband saying, A man of God came unto me. A man of God. It was a man. We get told it's the Lord. It's Jesus Christ. I believe it's Jesus Christ 100%. It's God in the flesh. In a physical form. The body of the Godhead. Okay? But she comes back and says, It's a man of God. It was a man. Okay. No wings. No, you know, the junk that you see in the cartoons, video games. What? It's none of that junk. It's just, it's a man. 
A man was standing there talking to her. Man of God, but there was something different about him. Man of God came unto me, his presence was different. And his countenance, here it is, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. The countenance, that's a good word. The countenance is different. Very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told he me his name. She didn't ask him who he was, and he didn't tell me who he was. Verse 7, But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let the man of God, man, which thou didst send come again unto us and teach us that we shall do unto the child that shall be born. And God hearkened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, but Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And this is what she should have done the first time, but this is the second time. You go, uh, uh, sisters in Christ that have husbands out there or saved fathers. When you've got strange men talking to you and you have no clue who they are, strangers, you go get your husband. That's what she does the second time. She did right by telling her husband the first time. Second time, she goes and gets her husband. And the woman made haste, ran, and showed her husband, and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said unto him, Art thou the man that speakest unto the woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child, and how shall we do? How shall we do unto him? And the angel of the Lord. Usually when it says the definitive angel, it's a specific angel of the Lord. I believe it's talking about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Sometimes it will say an angel of the Lord. It could be a regular angel, or it could be talking about Jesus Christ. But when it says the angel of the Lord. It's definitive. It's specific. Not just any angel. It's the angel of the Lord. Said unto Manoah, Of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I command her, let her observe. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, thou, though, though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. And if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. God, the, the soul. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. This is where it says, an angel of the Lord. But we've heard earlier it said, the angel. Verse 17. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name? And when thy saying come to pass, we may do thee honor. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Remember we said, it's not revealed until the New Testament. Great is the mystery of godliness. Why ask thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? It's not ready to be revealed yet. So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord, and the angel did wondrously. And Manoah and his wife looked on, for it came to pass when the flames went up towards heaven from off the altar that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flames of the fire, of the flame of the altar. Now this is a whole other study, but the flame of the altar, um, the, bu the burning bush, it says the, the angel of the Lord was in the bush, the burning bush, Moses. I believe it was the Holy Spirit, but Moses. Something about that, you know. Um, uh, I get the names so wrong, but uh, Daniel, the book of Daniel, about Meshach, Ish, uh, Abednego, the three, um, that are in the uh, fiery furnace. Then there's a fourth man in there. And Nebuchadnezzar looks and says, that fourth man is like unto the Son of God. All right. There's something different about these angels, especially the angel of the Lord. There's something different, but they look like men. 
And Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. But the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and to his wife. There it goes back to saying, the angel. Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto his wife, we shall surely die. Why? Because we have seen God. God and the flesh, the body of the Godhead, Jesus Christ. But seeing that it is secret, he wasn't ready to be revealed as Jesus Christ. It wasn't until he came into the likeness of sinful flesh that he was revealed as Jesus Christ. Okay. So we see two accounts. One of just regular angels and God being an angel of the Lord. And then here we see Jesus Christ, angel of the Lord. Okay, why is that important? Like I said, we'll get into it why Jesus in the Old Testament being an angel of the Lord, why that is that so important? We'll get into that a little bit. But you also have uh, you also have other angels that are I call regular angels, but then you have God who's referred to as an angel, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. Okay? God manifests in the flesh. So let's go on to the next topic. A little lower than the angels. Question mark. What does that mean? <laughs> okay, we're made a little lower than the angels. Okay, the angels are not incorruptible. How do we know that? Because a third of the angels will fall. It hasn't happened yet, but a third of the angels will fall. You also had angels, like I said, in Moses, or not Moses, uh, Noah's time, and back before Noah's time, that left their first estate and came down here and started marrying wives of the daughters of men. Okay. They did things that were wrong, and they, like I said, a third of the angels will fall someday. But they had immortality. You know, when we, this mortal shall put on immortality, this flesh, this corruption shall put on incorruption, but mortality. Okay. That being said, let's go to Psalms 8. Turn to Psalms chapter 8, verse 1. This is where we get that made a little lower than the angels, but I want to get into context. Psalms 8, 1. O Lord, O Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest steal the enemies and the avengers. When I consider thy heavens, the works of thy fingers... The moon and the stars, he's talking about things that were created by God. The moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. What is man that, that, that thou art mindful of him? Who am I, Lord? And the son of man that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. All the sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowls of the air, and the fish of the sea, and, whos and whatsoever passes through the path of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. We're made a little lower than the angels, and we've been told, we've been given charge of the earth to take care of it. You're, in ch you're supposed to take care of it. That was what Adam was supposed to do. Okay. But we're made a little lower than the angels. Hebrews 2, 7. That's where we get, we get to hear this again in the New Testament. Hebrews 2, 7. Remember, Hebrews is written to Hebrews, the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. But it says here, Thou hast made, thou hast, let's see, Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. It's repeating what's over in Psalms to the Jewish people. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, jump down a verse, uh, um, says, But we see Jesus who was made. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he may be, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Taste death. We've already talked about this in another study. We don't have to go into it hardcore. But the point is, is Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. That's what we're created in. I mean, that's what we are in right now. Likeness of sinful flesh. And it was only in that body was he able to die, was he able to take on the sins of the world and die for us. 
He couldn't do it in his incorruptible body that he was in in the Old Testament. He had to give up that incorruptible body and come in the likeness of sinful flesh. And we see another verse verifying that, proving that. Jesus was in the Old Testament, but it says here he came in the likeness. Um, he was made a little lower than the angels. What are you talking about? He, he came like us. One of us. He got tired. He got hungry. You know, he felt pain. He could die. Romans 8.3 says, um, that we talked about, you don't have to turn here, but we talked about this in other studies, for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son, in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Okay. Jesus came, was made a little lower than the angels. God gave up his old, incorruptible body for a corruptible one. Yet he never saw corruption. He, was, he never sinned. But I wanted to throw that in there. Okay, A little lower than the angels. It's so amazing because you look at stuff. I remember a brother in Christ uh, doing a teaching and talked about the heavens. What if, because they try to teach you that we're, there's galaxies upon galaxies and billions of light years and billions of light. What if it's just a little scroll? <laughs> you know, you look up and the, the, you see the heavens and it's like the, the clouds are rolled away, the stars are rolled away, and boom, there's heaven right there. It's just right there. We always try to make things out to be so far apart, and we're really not that far apart. We're just a little lower than the angels. Someday we will be as the angels. Okay? But angels are men. We are made, I want to do that verse to say that we're made a little lower than the angels. But we look like, I look like a man. Someone else, well, I'm getting older now, but back when I was 30 and was really in shape, you can have another guy come down that's 30 and really in shape, man, that's an angel. Man, man. The only way you can tell us apart is countenance. There'd be something different about it. You just see it. Not that you're seeing anything visual, physically different. It's just, there's just something different about his countenance. The way he carries himself. How he talks. Sometimes what he says. <laughs> okay, because he's speaking for the Lord. He's a messenger for the Lord. Okay. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23. We're going to mention some of the men in the Old Testament that were mighty men. And then we're going to talk about something that the angel of the Lord did. Real quick. To show that there is a contrast Okay. You look at uh, Samson, there's a contrast. He had the Holy Spirit in him. He wasn't like other men. There was something different about Samson. I mean, not every man can rip the, the, gate, the doors off a gate and these huge things and put them on his shoulders and walk out. You know? Uh, there was something different about him. What is it? The Holy Spirit. Okay? A messenger of God. He was ordained of God for a special purpose. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 20. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, I hope I'm probably going to mess this up. Jehoiada, I hope I didn't. The son of a valiant man of Ke Kebzil, who had done many acts. He slew two lion like men of Moab. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit and in and, and time of snow. These are valiant men that fought for King David. Okay? And with King David. Two lion-like men. A great video to watch is 33rd book when he talks about lion-like men. I still watch that every once in a while. It's just, I like some of his videos when he goes through and explains things where they try to change it in the Bible perversions because they can't handle the way the truth is. They can't stand the truth and they got to mess it up with the Bible perversions. Couldn't handle them. He killed two lion-like men. And then he went down and slew a lion. Also, 1 Chronicles 11.22 uh, talks about ben Benaniah, the son of Jehoadad, the son of a valiant man of Kabzil, who had done many acts. He slew two lion-like men of Moab. Also, he, slew, he went down and slew a lion in the pit in the snowy days. But, if you keep reading verse 23, it says, And he slew an Egyptian, a man of great stature, 
five cubits high, and the Egyptian's hand was a spear like a weaver's beam. And he went down to him with a staff and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. And you can read all about the mighty men of King David, even what King David did. Slew Goliath. You know, with a sling, a stone in a sling. <laughs> That's not what actually killed him. That knocked him out, and then he went and grabbed his own sword and cut off his head with his own sword. Okay. Now, the stone could have killed him. I have to read the story, but he grabbed his own sword and cut off his own head with a sword. This is Goliath, a big man. So you have men that can be valiant, that can be brave. Okay. They can some men that can do things that seem, you know, mighty and miraculous or something I couldn't do. Okay. But when you compare that, turn to Second Kings nineteen thirty three. Second Kings nineteen thirty three. By the way that he came. By the same shall he return, and shall not come into the city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake, and for my servant David's sake. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote the camp of the Assyrians, a hundred fourscore and five thousand. A hundred fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpse. Behold, I want to make sure I say his name right, but... Uh, Benaniah, he couldn't do that. He's an angel of the Lord. Now I believe it's Jesus Christ, but angels were a little lower than the angels. But the angels that are, God says, okay, I want you to do this, I want you to do that. When God gets involved, great things can happen. Miraculous things can happen. Like I said, you look at Samson. Good example. I'm talking about physical manifestations. Uh, Elijah, Moses, Okay? You can see a lot of miracles, signs and wonders, but it's God working through men. But when it comes to an angel, yeah. uh, 2 Chronicles 32, jump back over to 2 Chronicles 32. And for this cause Hezekiah the king and the prophet Isaiah the son of Ath Omaz prayed and cried to heaven, and the Lord sent an angel which cut off all the mighty men of valor and the leaders and captains in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned with shame of face to his own land. And when he was come into the house of his God, they that came forth of his own bowels slew him with their slew him there with the sword. Thus the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Shechem, the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others. And guided them on every side. So the angel of the Lord went through, slew tons of people. The angel of the Lord can come through and put off armies and get them to, to flee, get them to run, get them to go away. I mean, God, the angel of the Lord. Okay. So we're made a little lower than the angels, brothers and sisters in Christ. But someday we're going to be putting on this corruption shall put on incorruption, this mortality shall put on immortality. And it talks about how we're going to have the mind of Christ. And we're going to be serving him for all eternity like the angels do. The angels came down and when God said, okay, my judgment, that's what they were doing. They either passed in judgment or they were a messenger of the word of God. This is what God's word says. Mm -hmm. Today, we're supposed to be a light to the world. People are supposed to see Jesus in us. We're messengers. We're ambassadors for Jesus Christ today. But when we get at the catching away of the body of Christ, we're going to be on a whole other level. Okay? As far as uh, having the mind of Christ. Right now there's a lot of questions I'd like to ask, but I believe when we change, God's going to reveal all, a lot of answers to me. Are we still going to know everything? No. Why? Great is the mystery of godliness. Great is the mystery of godliness. Um... I want to read Psalms 9 real quick. Give me a second. So turn to Psalms 9. Um, because when you read about the Old Testament and you read about the angels, the mighty men of valor, but you read about the angels and what God could do and what God did do. Um, 
says here, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. I'll be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most, O thou most high. When my enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou saddest in thy throne judging right. Thou hast rebuked the heathen. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. Thou hast put out their name forever and ever. O thou enemy, dest o thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end. Thou hast destroyed cities. The memorial is perished with them. Sodom and Gomorrah, thou hast destroyed cities. But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. The great white throne judgment, or the judgment seat of Christ. Remember we talked about those two, judgment seat of Christ for saved sinners, Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, and the great white throne for all others, including the false converts out there, fake Christians. Okay? But it's been prepared. Verse 8, And he shall judge the world in righteousness, he shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in time of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. That know thy name will put their trust in thee. Remember, he has lots of names, but there's not one name above all names that are given among men whereby we must be saved. And that name is Jesus Christ for today. Okay. But thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee, that seek thee. Sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion, declare among the people his doings. When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble which I suffer of them that hate me. Okay, today, you know. We're going to go through that, but what we read back there about King David, uh, the mighty men, they were fighting, they had enemies coming. Uh, um, Elijah, they were trying to come to get Elijah, but God protected him. Thou that listest me up from the gate of death, that I may show forth all thy praise in the gates of the daughters of Zion, I rejoice in thy salvation. The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made, that they made. <laughs> the pit. In other words, anybody who goes to hell... Anybody who gets God's wrath upon them, here physically, or dies in their sins and goes to hell, this Bible says whose damnation is just. When God chastens me, I deserve it. I dug my own pit. It was me. I deserve it. Okay. They sunk down in the pit that they made, and the net which they hid in their own foot was taken. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wickedness, or sorry, the wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. The work of his own hands. I'm so blessed that my works are going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ, but my eternal destination is not based off my works. Like it will for everybody who goes to the judgment, uh, to the great white throne judgment, all the lost people. They're going to be judged according to their works. The works of their hands. Whose damnation is just. There is no, it's not my fault, it's somebody else's fault. No, it isn't. Uh, verse 17, The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expect expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail, let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Put them in fear, O Lord. That's how I got saved. Fear. See, the thing is, is a lot of these battle buildings, they don't teach the real Jesus Christ. It's all counterfeit Jesuses. Why? Because where's the fear? Where is the fear? We read about those two. Uh, uh, where When they realized it was an angel of the Lord, they fell on their face, thinking they were going to, if you kept reading, they're talking about, I think we're going to die, because we saw God. 
well, if he wanted to kill us, he would have killed us. But there was fear. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah. Where's the fear at? You have angels. You have the angel of the Lord. God. God. In a physical form. The body. God manifests in the flesh when it comes to Jesus Christ. In the likeness of sinful flesh, in the Old Testament, he was manifest in his incorruptible body. There was a physical body there. Where's the fear? But I just wanted to read that because you read that whole thing and it talks about God's judgment. And we just read about a lot of that where he'd send angels to help um, punishment. To pour out, when he pours out his wrath, um, sending angels in the time of Jacob's trouble. Read about the angels, the time of Jacob's trouble, where they're opening, he's opening seals, he's sending angels, and just pouring out his wrath on this world. One of the things the angels would do is they would carry out the judgment of, of God. The other thing that they did, they were messengers of God. They would pass on God's word to somebody else. That I'm here to have a message. This is a message from God. You know? But angels, once again, they're men that are a little bit above us. We're made a little lower than the angels. So, I just wanted to really get into it. I took a big portion of the study to talk about angels and what they are. But the Bible says he was seen of angels. I wanted to get it specifically. These are men that are, above, that are created a little bit above mankind. Angels are, that look like men that are created above mankind. Just a little bit higher than mankind. So turn to Matthew 4.1. So the Bible says that he was, Jesus was seen of angels. Well, first of all, in the Old Testament, when there was three of them there with Abraham, he was seen of angels. Two angels were there, and then the angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ. But this is talking about in his earthly ministry. We're going to talk about his earthly ministry when he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Okay. We're going to get into this. I talked about that a little bit. but Tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards a hungered. And when, and when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. If... I'll be the Son of God. See, that's the biggest thing today. I know we've already talked about this in other studies. I still have to push. You have all these professing Christians out there, but they still, with their actions, and sometimes with their words, when you back them in the corner, their words are always going to change. They live like if, if, if. They don't have that full, hardcore, Jesus is the Son of God, Jesus is God, fully and completely. They don't live like that. Their Jesus is not God fully and completely. He's not the capital S Son of God. Connection. That's what the of is. Remember? Angel, the angel of the Lord. There's connection. They take the connection away and they, they, they have that attitude of if. If. And then they attack people like us that are against the pagan trinity and stand for the Godhead of the King James Bible where Jesus Christ is connected to God the Father. And God the Father is connected to the Spirit, capital S, Spirit of God, which is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, capital S, Spirit of God, is connected to the capital S, Son of God, which is Jesus Christ. They're all connected. They're one. But they're bought. the difference, the distinction is body, soul, and spirit. If. If. And that's how they live their life. You can look at it and see how they live their life. Verse 4. But, they ant but he answered... And said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into a holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. And said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot upon against a stone. Jesus said unto him, it is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Verse 8. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And remember, we were put in charge to take care of this world. But we lost our dominion over this world when Adam uh, sinned. 
So Satan gets in, he gets his foothold in this world, and he's got his kingdoms. But he goes and shows them all these kingdoms. And the glory of them, and said unto him, All these things I will give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. In other words, they belong to Satan, and he'll give them to him. Because why? Because Jesus doesn't come back and say, uh, You forget, this all belongs to God. He didn't say that. What did he say? Verse 10, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. That's why I was told that a lot of these false Christians out there that are the if, if, if he be the capital S Son of God, if, if, those people that worship a Jesus who isn't God fully and completely, okay, what's going on? They've taken Satan up on his offer, and they've chosen the world over Jesus Christ. These Babel buildings, these fake Christians out there, what we call them false converts, okay, false brethren, what the Bible says, false brethren. What happens? Satan comes along and offers them the world. You can have the world and still call yourself a Christian. Really? And they take it. I said this in other studies and done more in-depth studies, but I still have to keep pushing that up there. You have Jesus, the angel of the Lord, and you have Satan, and they choose Satan. They choose a counterfeit Jesus. Okay. Here it is, verse 11. Um, the angels. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. So here's a time where it mentions angels in the presence of Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. He was seen of angels. Mark 1.13 says, you don't have to turn here, but it says, And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and was in the, in the wild, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. There's another retelling of the story, but it mentions a second time that angels came and ministered unto him. He was seen of angels. But Satan, what I was talking about, Satan, the ultimate counterfeit, all these false converts out there worshiping Satan as Jesus Christ. Why is it so important in the Old Testament that there's people that will fight us on it and say that Jesus is not the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament? Okay. What is Satan trying to do? Turn to Isaiah 14, 12. You know why Satan likes to be referred to as the angel, as an angel, when he is a fallen cherub? Question mark. That's a good question. He wants to, we're going to read here, he wants to be like God. So why would he transform himself into an angel of light unless somebody else was referred to as an angel? You know, the angel of the Lord? Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Not star. Star doesn't belong in there at all. That's Satanism. That's, that's Satan trying to be Jesus, trying to be God, and these Bible perversions. It says, O Lucifer, son of the morning, period, uh, exclamation point. There is no word star there. How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. What are stars? Like I said, angels, what are they? There's a good study in there where the stars are angels. Okay? Above the stars of God. He, want, he wants to be above the angels. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. I will be like the Most High. He wants to be like God. Body, soul, and spirit. That's why there's a pagan trinity. That's why the trinity is pagan. Three physical manifestations of a false god. Okay? And the uh, time of Jacob's trouble, you're going to have the false prophet, you have the beast, and you have, I hope I'm saying it right, and you have Satan. I, uh, you have the man of perdition, um, but you got three of them there. My brain, I'm trying to think of the name, uh, but you have the false prophet comes in first, and he paves the way for the, fall, the Antichrist, I'm sorry, the Antichrist. 
And then you have the beast, which is Satan. There's your pagan trinity. He tries to be like the Most High. So when it comes to God manifest in the flesh, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, the body of the Godhead, it's Jesus Christ, he's referred to as an angel in the Old Testament. But the biggest deception is that Satan, and I'm going to get into this more in depth in another study of the ultimate counterfeit that I'm working on, but Satan is a fallen cherub. He's not an angel at all. But they always try to refer to Satan as a, uh, as a fallen angel. He's a fallen angel. He's not an angel. He's a cherub. He's a fallen cherub. Once again, 33rd book does a great study on cherub. What are they? They're really good. I like how he did that. I turn to Ezekiel 28, 11. We read, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, in Ezekiel 28, 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The Son of Man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of the tablets and of the pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Talking about Satan. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity, iniquity, was found in the iniquity, sin. I will be like the Most High. He wants to be like Jesus Christ. Satan is a physical creation, body. Jesus he is God manifest in the flesh. He wants to be like Jesus. Second Corinthians 11. Turn to check. Second Corinthians 11:13. So this was amazing because it's like ultimate counterfeit. Jesus is an angel of the Lord. He was tempted by Satan. Join me. Why would? I mean, think about it. Why would Satan tempt him then? Because he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Why wasn't he trying to tempt him in the Old Testament? Why isn't he trying to tempt him in the <laughs> in the time of Jacob's trouble? Because he was at his weak, he was in a body that was his, what you call his weakest point. It's God manifest in the flesh, but he was in the likeness of sinful flesh, a corruptible body. And he was trying to get him to be corruptible. And Jesus wasn't. He was perfect. But this is what I wanted to talk about. 2 Corinthians 11 13 says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Today you got a lot of people saying, I'm an apostle, I'm an apostle. There was only 12 apostles. They're dead. They're, uh, one, uh, is, I think, is in the bottomless pit. Uh, the one that betrayed uh, Jesus Christ. But the 11 that, that, that made it, and then Paul became the, the 12th, they're in heaven right now. There are no apostles today. Right? But there's still people trying to say they're apostles. 13. And no marvel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Why? Because in the Old Testament, Jesus was referred to as an angel of the Lord. And what does Satan want to do? He wants to counterfeit Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the light of the world. He's the light of the world. So what does Satan do? He tries to copy that by transforming himself into an angel of light. He's a counterfeit Jesus. Verse 15, Therefore it is no great marvel if his ministers also be transformed into ministers of righteousness. False converts. You have a false Jesus and you have false Christians that follow that false Jesus. They transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. 
Now we use that for saying we judge them because the Bible talks about by their fruits you shall know them. We're to judge people by their fruits that change life. Okay? Good works to change life, the good fruit, will follow true conversion. But this is also, I believe, talking about where their end is, whose end shall be according to their works. Remember, eternal destination at the great white throne is based off works. At the judgment seat of Christ, it's based off the blood of Jesus Christ. Works, Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ, whose end shall be according to their works. They're false. They're fake. If they don't truly get saved, I was a fake and false convert for a long time. If we truly don't get saved and born again, we're going to go to hell. We're going to have to stand before Jesus Christ at the, judgment, uh, the great white throne. If you're lost and not born again, you're going to have to stand before Jesus Christ, the great white throne, and he's going to judge you according to your works. And see if you can get in. See, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. An old hymn. Okay? Why? Because no matter works is ever going to get you into heaven. One sin means you can't get into heaven. If you sin one sin, you're toast. Doesn't matter how little of a sin you think it is, one sin, you're toast. You don't stand a chance. Whose end is according to their works. In other words, he's saying they're false. They're fake. So you're going to have a Jesus, uh, Satan, who's trying to transform himself into an angel of light. He's trying to counterfeit the angel of the Lord, which is Jesus Christ. It's another evidence of Jesus Christ. Why? Because why would Satan try to transform himself into an angel of light? If, if the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is not referring to Jesus Christ. It makes no sense. It does if you believe, you know, comparing Scripture with Scripture, the angel of the Lord is Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, a little, probably went off on a little bit of a tangent, but I wanted to throw that in there real quick. The counterfeit. Okay. Angel. He was seen of angels. They came and ministered unto him. And Satan is the ultimate counterfeit, trying to be like the angel of the Lord. Okay. In the time of Jacob's trouble, he's going to be able to pull a third of the angels down to earth, and they're going to be cast out, and they're going to be roaming around. Matthew chapter 16, 27. Turn to Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. For the Son of Man, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. And in Matthew 25, 31, it says, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. I want to throw that in there real quick, because seen of angels, someday we will become angels. But the men, the apostles, because we talked about how there's false apostles, but the real apostles, they actually physically saw Jesus Christ, and someday they will become as the angels. We all will, that are truly saved and born again. So those are the men that were saved after, I know they couldn't be saved, but when they were there, when Jesus was physically on the earth, later after his death, burial, and resurrection got saved, did the work of the Lord, they're up in heaven right now, they're eyewitnesses, seen of angels. They're eyewitnesses, it's something to think about. They're eyewitnesses. Okay, an apostle is somebody who's physically seen Jesus Christ and his earthly ministry. And then you have Paul. I almost want to say because I said it's earthly ministry, but then you have Paul. He saw Jesus Christ. Okay? Physically seeing Jesus Christ. Today, nobody's physically seen Jesus Christ. He's up in heaven preparing a place for us. Okay? But you can look at that and just something to talk about among the brethren saying, hey, do you really think that that would count as being seen of angels? The men that were there when, during Jesus' earthly ministry that got saved afterwards. His death, burial, and resurrection. Matthew chapter 22, jump down to Matthew chapter 22, verse 30. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but as the angels of God, that's why I said think about it, or as the angels of God in heaven. We come down with him, but we were also witnesses. Not we, me, but there's men there. Paul, Peter, John, 
Okay? These are eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ that someday become as the angels. Someday they will be as the angels and there will be witnesses. Eyewitnesses. Um, marrying, uh, you have Matthew that talks about they're neither married nor are given a marriage but as the angels in heaven. But Mark 12, 25 is, is a parallel passage. And Luke 20, 35 is also a parallel passage. So it's mentioned three times in the four Gospels that we will be as the angels in heaven. So that's where I get that. I'm not just saying it to say it. Okay, but That's where I get it from the scriptures. So you look at that and you go, okay, could that be considered witnesses? Everyone that got saved that were back then that physically saw Jesus Christ. Something to think about. Okay, but he was seen of angels, but we all saw that angels came down and ministered to him. Was that the only time? No. Turn to uh, Luke 22. Luke 22, chapter, verse 40. And these times, when I was doing this study, I was like, oh, I, didn't, I don't know how I missed that, but I missed the angel part. When he was tempted, you just read right past it. The angels, you know, about Satan, and that they ministered unto him. You run past it so fast, and you, and you go back and look and go, oh yeah, I did read that before, but now since we're doing a specific study looking at that, he was seen of angels. There was actually angels that came down and ministered unto him. Luke 22, 40. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. This is Jesus Christ, after he broke the bread, they sang some hymns, and they went to the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. I think it's the place, I'm, I'm using the right place, that uh, he likes to go to to pray. And that's where they are. Verse 41. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast. And kneeling down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou wilt be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Verse 43. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Here's another evidence of him being seen of angels. An angel came down, strengthened him again. 44, he's in the likeness of sinful flesh, this weak body. 44, and being in an, but being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, the great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow, and said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. An angel, I, it's like I almost missed that part when you, re, you read past it so fast sometimes. But an angel of the Lord came down. Notice it says, an angel of the Lord. Because the angel of the Lord is Jesus Christ. An angel, not of the Lord, just says an angel unto, uh, appeared unto him. He was seen of angels. Turn to Luke, uh, jump down a couple chapters to Luke 24, 22. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. Remember the whole story about the angels inside the, the sepulchre? And outside. In one uh, passage it talks about one of them being Jesus Christ, but they, she didn't know it. They, but they're angels. 24. And certain of them which were with us when this went to the sepulchre and found it even so as the woman had said, but him they saw not. So you had angels that said, he's alive. Eyewitnesses. Seen of angels. We've seen Jesus Christ. He's alive. They're witnesses. Another instance, uh, turn to John chapter 20, verse 11. This is the, another account of the same story, but it gives a little bit more detail. So let's read about that. John 20, verse 11. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. And see two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet. Here's the two angels where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. 
verse 14. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. You have two angels, right? Scene of angels. Remember, angels are witnesses. Angels are messengers of the Lord. Angels can go to, you know, uh, help with the judgment, you know, pass on judgment. You know. Remember the two angels, they blinded everybody uh, uh, that was out there, because it was the whole city just came out to try to get them at uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, that's judgment of the Lord. Turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 7. But you see there, there was angels there. He was seen of angels. They were even eyewitnesses to his resurrection. Acts 1, 7. And he said unto them, it, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons, which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfast towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven, the same Jesus which is taken up from you in heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Two men. Now it doesn't say angels, but it says two men stood by him in white apparel. Sounds like angels to me. Eyewitnesses. They've seen Jesus. They've sat there, watched Jesus go up. And then they sat, they're sitting there looking at these other men. Why do you guys keep looking up? We see another instance of scene of angels. Angels being eyewitnesses. So, now the other thing I threw in here is three parts to the resurrection. There's three parts to the resurrection. Uh, when Jesus was raised, you had the Old Testament saints that went up with them, and some of them were physically raised, but you had the Old Testament saints. Okay? And then you had... Um, us at the catching away of the body of Christ is the second part of the resurrection. And then you have people in the time of Jacob's trouble, which will be the third part. There will be a resurrection. So there's three parts to the resurrection to make it considered a whole. That's why it refers to the resurrection. For it to be complete, all three parts have to happen. One's already happened, part one. Part two hasn't happened yet, but we're getting close. And then part three will happen in the time of Jacob's trouble. But part we put on here, these two old men... Could they be Old Testament saints that are sitting there in white robes? Old Testament saints that Jesus went to go down to hell to Abraham's bosom, which we're going to read here in a second, real quick. To catch them up, could those two men be Old Testament saints? But they're as the angels. Not yet, because we haven't had the full resurrection yet, but for the Old Testament saints, though. Okay. For the church age, we haven't had the ca uh, catching away of the body of Christ, where the dead in Christ rise first, and then we which remain shall be caught up with them. Okay? But the Old Testament saints, just something to think about. Could they be two Old Testament saints? They're eyewitnesses. They're now, as the angels in heaven, they're eyewitnesses. Something to think about. Okay? So, um... We're talking about that. Go ahead and turn to Luke 16. Luke 16, 19. Turn to Luke 16, 19. We're almost done. I'm sorry about this being so long, but Luke 16, 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Notice it doesn't say parable. Jesus is given an example of what it was like when you died and how things work, where you would go. There was two places in the Old Testament to go. You could go to the Abraham's bosom, or you can go to the lake of fire, not lake of fire, uh, hell, which is the fire side where you're burning. Okay. 
There was a rich, certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which laid at his gates full of sores. And desires to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. He had one that had a on, heaven on earth, one had hell on earth, what I'd call like hell on earth, which is not even close, but you understand what I'm saying, that, that it had the hardest time on earth. Had it great, had it hard, hardship. Verse 22, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried to a carried by the angels unto Abraham's bosom, the rich man also died and was buried. Carried by angels. So back in the Old Testament, what this God's given us an example of is when someone died that was destined, for, that not destined, that, that God said, okay, he belongs in Abraham's bosom, an angel would take the soul down to Abraham's bosom. Okay? An angel would take him down to Abraham's bosom. So my question is, and I don't have this in my notes, but where it talks about how Jesus went to the heart of the earth after he died, um, people say, well, he was burning in hell, they false teaching. No, he went to Abraham's bosom. But did angels carry him down there? Did he keep up with that, or did he just go down by, he didn't need angels? I mean, this is something for you guys to talk about if you want to. I can't be dogmatic about it. I can't say this is absolute truth, but it says the way it was set up, God's given us an example, angels carried people to Abraham's bosom. Okay, and then Jesus went down uh, the captivity. I can't remember the verse exactly, but um, captive captivity. In other words, he went down to Abraham's bosom because they couldn't go to heaven. Their sins were covered, but they weren't washed away. They weren't taken away. They couldn't go to heaven until Jesus died and went down and got them and brought them up. But I read that part and I was like, there's another thing about angels. So if angels escorted him down there, there's another time of being seen by angels. If and that's what happened, I don't know. That's something we can ask when we get to see Jesus face to face. Okay? But it, could that have been another example of being seen of angels? Hmm. Maybe. But 1 Timothy 3.16, once again, like I said, I don't know about that. Why is that? And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Great is the mystery of godliness. How do the things work? How does God, Jesus in the Old Testament, have an incorruptible body? How does he give that up for a corruptible one? How does that work? Great is the mystery of godliness. Question, the angels that were escorting, did Jesus get an escort down to Abraham's bosom? I don't know. I don't know. Great is the mystery of godliness. You have these angels that just appear that are ministering to Jesus Christ. Can I explain how, like I can explain a little bit of what the Bible talks about, the differences, there's things that angels can do that man can't do by himself, but can I can sit here and t tell you completely the differences in all of God's creation and how the levels of differences between angels and men in exact detail? Great is the mystery of godliness. God created it, angels, but he created men just a little bit below the angels. Okay. But great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. Seen of angels. So I understand I kind of went around a little bit, but I wanted to talk about what angels were. Kind of went off on a tangent a little bit about, you know, the counterfeit, the ultimate counterfeit, why Satan wants to be called an angel of the Lord. He wants to be like the angel of the Lord. That's why he likes to transform himself into an angel of light. But Jesus was seen of angels. How does this work? The two men in the white robes that saw Jesus go back up. You know, are they angels? Are they Old Testament saints? <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't know. Okay. But great is the mystery of godliness. God will reveal some things to us, brothers and sisters in Christ. But one thing that you need to keep in mind as we're going through these studies, when we talked about manifest in the flesh and justified in the spirit, he will reveal some things to us. He'll let us know about it. He wants us to know Him. He'll reveal things to us. But never get to that point where you feel like you know everything. Great. In other words, there's no mystery. It says great is the mystery of godliness. In other words, there's always going to be mystery. There's always going to be things we can't explain. 
Not yet. Not until we have the mind of Christ. Okay? And that will be at the catching away of the body of Christ. There's just some things we're not going to understand. There's times where God's like, you're not ready to understand it yet. He might reveal something to you, brother, sister in Christ, a year from now. And you're like, I read this a million times. How come I'm only figuring this? Because God's like, now you're ready. You're in a position and you're ready to understand it. I can reveal a little bit more of myself to you. Okay. I know more about the Lord Jesus Christ today than I did when I first got saved. And that's how it should be. If you're like, well, I know the same as I did when I got saved, that's a problem. You should be growing closer and closer to our Lord Jesus Christ. You should start, le you should start learning more about Him and, and walking with Him every day. You should know a lot more about Jesus Christ, your God, your Savior, now than you did when you first got saved. But there's still always going to be mystery. There's still things I don't understand and can't explain. I'm going to have questions. I mean, if we were to write down a list, I, I might do this one of these times. What if we were to take a notebook and write down a list and just write down questions? And if, you, if I'd done this, I didn't do it, but if you're newly saved, try doing it. But if I wrote down a lot of the questions I had when I was newly saved, I'd say probably a fourth to a third of them would be crossed out. God already answered them. But think about it. You write down all these questions. And then as you go through your life serving Jesus Christ, studying His Word, and staying in His Word, the, the questions get drawn, uh, you draw a line through the questions. Okay, God answered that one. Okay, God answered that one. And you'll see there's still a lot of questions He hasn't answered, but there's some that He has. Because He's revealing Himself to us. That's a good example. Okay. Uh, Luke 15, we're going to end it on Luke 15.10. Luke 15.10, if you want to turn there, uh, it's just a verse that says, Likewise. Luke 15, 10, Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. We always say that over one per, uh, sinner that gets saved. Okay. Um, I pray that you guys are staying in the Word of God. Okay, please stay in the Word of God. Um, but like I said, it stays in long, I apologize. Scene of angels. Okay, angels have a part to play, and they have a role. They have boundaries, just like we all do. We're all created in certain boundaries, um, where God says, this is your role, this is what I have for you. Um, but Jesus, he was seen of angels. Okay, it's one of the mysteries. He was seen of angels. Angels would just appear and be there. Okay, uh, those two that just appeared with white clothing, you know. And the crowd as Jesus is going up. And the Old Testament, the angels, great in the, is the mystery. Okay. So, stick to the book and have the attitude that, hey, I'm not going to ever know everything, but I'm supposed to keep growing closer and closer to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and He will, over time, reveal things to me as I grow closer. Like I said, those questions are going to get answered. Some questions are going to get answered. There will be some questions on that list that get crossed off. I had this question way back when, but God finally answered it. Praise the Lord. He answered this one. Well, I'm still waiting for that one. I still don't understand that question. I mean, I haven't found the answer to that question. Or that one. You know what I'm saying? I'm supposed to be growing closer and closer to the Lord. Okay. So, I'll end this with grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Stay in the Word. And thank you for watching.